Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first CAD Lunch Forum of the spring semester. I'm Leora Vysotsky. I'm the staff managing director here at the center, which is also run by a faculty board of directors from across our programs. Uh, this year, the board consists of Fernando Lara, Miriam Solis, Martin Hadish, Nerea Feliz, and Alex Yeshka. Like we were just talking about, I want to emphasize that we typically would be serving you lunch in person and that we will again soon, as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, CAD lunch forums are really meant to be more informal presentations and opportunities for faculty and students to share works in progress, new directions for their research that they might want to receive feedback on, or in this case, to share what it's like to straddle academia and practice. Um, and so in order to facilitate that, our presenter will talk for about 40, 45 minutes, after which we'll open the floor to questions and discussion. So I encourage you to raise your hand or put a question or comment in the chat as they arise. I'm very pleased to introduce to you today, Juan Miro. Juan was born in Barcelona and obtained his professional degree at the Escuela de Arquitectura of the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. In 1989, he earned a Fulbright scholarship to, comp to complete a post-professional master's degree at Yale. Juan has lectured and published extensively on the role of architectural profession in civic life, the relationship between the man-made and nature, and the relevance of history for designers. He is the David Bruton Jr. Centennial Professor in Urban Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, where he founded Studio Mexico and teaches Mexican architectural history. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. In 2000, Juan co-founded Miro Rivera Architects alongside his wife, Rosa Rivera, and his brother-in-law, Miguel Rivera. The prestigious design firm has won over 100 design awards, including the AR Award for Emerging Architecture, the Texas Architecture Firm Award, the Architectural Di Digest AD100, and Arc Daily's list of the world's best architects. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Juan. You can take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Leora, for the presentation. It's uh, exciting to be back at the center. Uh, it's, uh, I think that probably the fourth or fifth, fifth time, I think, that I have presented before. I, 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 it's great to see you, Leora, but I'm missing Michael a little bit, those introductions that Michael gave, you know, before and, and, uh, uh, it's great to see a new a new approach to the center, but maintaining all the great things that the center has done over the years. So I'm very happy to be part of the center again. And 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 once again, the 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 topic that I'm covering is uh, uh, very different from the other ones that I have I've covered over the years. And 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 uh, as you said, in this case, it's a little it's a little different. It's uh, it's um, it's really, I'm going to talk about the book that we just published and more as a, not, not so much about the specific projects, but about the, 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 the effort that went into making it and describing the book itself, uh, which is very different than what I have talked in the other, in the other presentations here at the center. So I'm very happy to be here and I thank everybody for, for joining. I know that it's a busy time at the beginning of classes and everybody getting ready. So I can imagine that, uh, uh, a lot of people are finishing their studio <laughs> syllabus and everything right before class, like I probably will be doing after this presentation before the 1.30. So let me let me start by by let me just move this a little bit so I can get the up and down here. So the 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 title of the book is uh, Building a New Arcadia, Miro Rivera Architects. Uh, and uh, as I said, I'm going to, I'm going to specifically uh, focus on the book as an object, as a, as a, as a, as a thing, a physical thing. And it's, it's great to see books surviving the, the digital world. I mean, I think it's something that is uh, interesting to see how at some point it felt like books maybe were going to disappear. And all of a sudden the books, the sales of books uh, apparently is going up again and, and I think that we all value those objects in our library and, and I know that in, in academic circles we're particularly fond of our books and how they sit in the bookshelves and what they mean and how we remember and reconnect with things that we have read and those all the books that we have there that we are hoping to read at some point you know so this is this is a, an effort that took a long time 
it was uh, it was uh, 20 years of work that is being uh, uh, you know in corporate condensed in the book. There are a lot of people that contributed to this. Uh, over even if we have a small a small firm, our our, our, our firm is not very big, but. Over the years, uh, we were counting that there were 82 different architects and designers that have uh, worked with us and many consultants and not to count all the institutions and clients that we have worked with. But the book itself took really three years in the making and and a lot of uh, back and forth. Now we communicate a lot, obviously, via email still going on, a lot of uh, 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 drawings, photographs and coordination. And uh, it, is, uh, it is something that I could not have done if I had not taken time off from the school. So I think the school is, 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 is being great. But uh, in 2018, when I took a year off, I realized that I had been teaching for, 20, for 22 years without taking more than one semester only once. So I had taken only one semester off once. And that, that year, when I took the, the year off, is when I decided this is it, because we had been talking about a book after 10 years of our firm. So we just couldn't get it done. And then at the end, we decided, well, 2018, we may as well do it for the 20 years. So we ended up doing the book for 20 years uh, of work. And 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 it was, uh, it was uh, a good way to reflect on all the trajectories that we have uh, pursued before getting where we are and how everything started. And, and, and in this case, uh, Leora mentioned it in the, in the introduction, uh, I'm very lucky to, to be able to work every day with uh, my wife, my brother-in-law. So I'm working with my, my best friends uh, and uh, my partners in, in every sense of the way. And I know that partnerships are very different. I, I saw firsthand the one Charles Guadme and Bob Siegel had, very different, you know, they didn't really mingle outside the professional world. In, in our case, our lives are very much connected at every level. And uh, obviously, I couldn't do any of the things that I'm doing if it was not for having the support of uh, Rosa and Miguel. And Rosa and I moved to Austin earlier in, in 1997. And then we finally convinced Miguel to join us uh, in 2000. And that's when he moved to Austin. These photographs when we were young, no beard and and uh, and looking forward for uh, uh, the future. So that's uh, that's at the beginning. Uh, is uh, shortly after we started the the firm, Miro River Architects. But if we go even farther back, we started really in our place in the places where we studied. Uh, Miguel uh, studied in Puerto Rico. I studied in Madrid, like Leora said. I had been born in Barcelona, but we moved to Madrid when I was very young. And uh, uh, this shaped a lot of the things that uh, I carry with me when I came to the US. And uh, uh, Miguel, same thing, he grew up in Puerto Rico, he studied in Puerto Rico, and we both came to the US to do our, our graduate work with uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of sound uh, preparation from our different universities, but enriching all that experience when we came to the US. Uh, Miguel went to Colombia, went to Yale. And in Yale's where I met uh, Charles Wathme. And Charles Wathme became a friend, a mentor. Uh, this is the, shortly after he became ill when he came to Austin to lecture at the school and he's visiting one of our projects. And uh, he's the one who actually introduced me to Miguel. So when I went to work at his firm, I was his student at Yale and then went to work with him. And uh, when I went to the office with my father who didn't speak English, uh, Wathme introduced me to Miguel so he could give a tour of the office in Spanish to, to my father and myself. And uh, so I will always be thankful to Guadme for that. Charlie was a fantastic person and, and in a way is the, is the, is the reason we, we ended up in Austin as well. So, you know, this is for all the students out there. You just never know what life is going to, moments that are critical for your life can happen in, in, in ways that you can never really plan the way it happened in this case. And, it, and then and then Austin appears in the in the picture. It was a, a project with uh, with uh, uh, Charles Guadme when I was working there. Brought me to Austin, and uh, my wife and I had just married, and we had a wonderful place in New York City. We were very excited about New York, and then it happened like what happens to a lot of people that come to Austin. You know, you you fall in love with a fantastic place. And in a way, when you think about the title of the book, Building a New Arcadia, is, is in a way you can say that, you know, we found our Arcadia here. And the, the beauty of Austin is something that is uh, 
you know, not a surprise for uh, many people. The, 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 the perception of the city was very limited in my case before I came here. And, and, and the impact was immediate. So even if we were excited about our new place in New York, we had just bought a great apartment. We, we, we just were very much seduced with this uh, wonderful place. And the, the notion of Arcadia that is uh, part of what the theme of the book is, is, is this connection with nature and the notion of living close to nature. I expanded it a little bit to the sense of, uh, of everybody's looking for a place to thrive and to, and to, and to lead a life that, that can be fulfilling. So Arcadia became that, that place for us here in Austin. And, and the, the, the firm that we started uh, grew over time, although we have been pretty stable over the years. We don't want to be a big firm. We, we have ranged between 12 and 18 uh, or less, but uh, nothing, nothing that we cannot fit in the, in, the, in the building where we are. And so this is an old photograph. A lot of the people that have worked that are part of the work that is being collected in this book were students from UT, uh, many of them my students before. And it's a, it's a fantastic thing to see them many moving to other places and growing and starting their own offices and, and, and keeping in touch with them. So it's been a great experience. So when talking about the book itself, as I said, let's, let's think about how we went about it. So one of the first things that we had to think about is who is going to contribute to the book. And uh, so we, we started to think about people that would like to have uh, 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 as contributors to the to the book and 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 first in the list was uh, Michael Sorkin. Michael Sorkin was uh, uh, a professor of mine at Yale also so we had kept in touch over the years. Uh, he had fond memories of his time at uh, Austin. He 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 was good friends with Larry Dole and 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 so he has uh, uh, well, as you know, when I when I first had him as a student, as a, as a, as a professor at uh, Yale in in 1990, he was not yet the prominent uh, critic that he became, but he was a very influential person for me since the beginning. And so, it was uh, very sad for us to learn when he died of uh, COVID in March in New York. Uh, and uh, it's very, it's very, it's very sad, sad for us still to think about the fact that you know we cannot show the book to him anymore, even if he was uh, very inspirational for the for the book. So he he did write the introduction to the book. Uh, it's probably one of his last published writings, uh, uh, and it was uh, um, it was particularly sad because I, I tried to get in touch with him without knowing anything the day that he was brought into the hospital and he died two days later. His widow told me and, and he was, you know, my instinct was maybe I sent an email to him saying, hey, how are you doing? And, and then all of a sudden, no response. I say, well, that's very strange. And then and then I learned in the news that he had he had died. So the other contributor, uh, we have four, the other contributor is Juan Luis uh, de las Rivas. Uh, uh, he's uh, very interesting because he's from Spain, but I met him in Austin and met him in Austin because Fritz Steiner, the former dean of the school, invited him. He's an urban planner, very well known for, he's an architect, but he, 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 he's uh, also uh, an urban designer and, and, and professor and author. He has written some of the best books about uh, uh, history of urban design that I know. And he was a very, he's very well, he knows very well the Americas, the American continent in general and, and Austin. So he wrote the main essay of the, of the book. And it's very clear that he puts the, the work in the context of Austin and the urban aspect of the city. So, and we became very good friends, but it's interesting because Fritz invited him, but he had to go out of town. So he asked me if I could help host him when he came to to Austin invited by by Fritz and that's how we became we became friends so even if it's uh, from Spain we met here then Nina Rapaport Nina Rapaport has had a long uh, 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 relation with Yale she's the the publisher of uh, the, the director of the publishing uh, that is done at the Yale School of Architecture she's a curator historian she has known Miguel for you know 30 years and she's uh, uh, giving a, neither, a, a different perspective as someone from New York with a historian eye and, and, and a very interesting range of uh, interests in, 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 in her career. 
And then uh, the other contributor that we invited was Carlos Jimenez. And Carlos Jimenez is a, a, a very successful architect and professor at Rice University. But uh, we felt an affinity with him in the sense that, you know, he he's the only one from Texas that we invited as a contributor. And 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 is uh, in, in a way we, we have some similarities as immigrants uh, coming to Texas and making a home here. So he, he could bring that perspective as well. And, and also, obviously, we have the, the, the Latin American connection, the Hispanic connection. And I think that he gave a fantastic uh, effort in contributing to the book. So all of them were very instrumental in advising to the book and, and in specific with their pieces to, to the book. Then, then we had to incorporate photographers and the photographers was uh, an interesting part of the book and and the the first one that uh, well the first one that I'm talk about, I'm going to talk about is a Belgian photographer called Sebastian Schutiser and uh, another uh, architect here that's from Spain that is now in living in Austin that's also a great photographer I talk about it and talk about him in a second he's the one who introduced us to to him Ibai Rigby introduced us to his work. We didn't know his work. He had never photographed a, a contemporary architecture. He photographed, he became known for photographing um, remote uh, uh, middle, uh, middle aged uh, little churches in the mountains of Spain. Then he photographed uh, also all uh, mud mosques in, in Niger, in, in Africa, and then dolmens in, in Korea. So he has had very specific books published on on this type of work, but then interesting things that he uses a, a camera, there's a pinhole camera, no lens, no manipulation. No, he cannot even see what he's photographing when he's up there in that ladder. So we, it was risky. We invited him to come. We hired him to, to do uh, a photograph all, with no basically restrictions. You go there and you take photographs of whatever you, you want and however you want. So it was a fantastic uh, uh, effort on his part. He spent five weeks doing that, and 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 it was uh, a great collection of photographs. We ended up with forty-eight pinhole photographs. We included four, twenty-four in the book. I'll, I'll show you in a second, and and they are all done with this uh, this method, this uh, pinhole camera, and and especially in this. And it, it was interesting for us because we were attracted to this uh, raw, uh, beautiful, and the connection with the nature that his work always showed. But at the same time, it was a very interesting thing to see how he was interpreting what he was seeing and how he was uh, uh, looking at it with this method. So it's almost like slow photography, literally. And uh, he went and he, he, uh, he, did a fantastic job in in documenting this so the photographs are, are are beautiful in terms of the atmosphere that he was atmosphere he was able to to convey and it's his first attempt to 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 do uh, contemporary architecture and and we we are planning to do exhibits that are separate for for just the work and then because Austin was such an important protagonist, there's no one else that can do better photography from cities, from the air than Ivan Ban. So we we got on a plane. I, I'm, I'm, this is my picture, taking a, a picture of him taking photographs of Austin. And uh, it was it was uh, great. He told us what kind of plane he needed. So we rented a plane and we went on a plane with him. And, you know, I'm I'm not the pilot. The pilot was in front of him. I'm the, behind him and taking taking photographs of 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 Austin from the air. So. We, 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 we wanted the book not, you know, be very much about that aspect of, of where the work is and what the context. So we're talking about cities. It's not about just architecture. We're talking about all that aspect of the context of the work. Ibai Rigby is the, the one who introduced us to Sebastian, took also fantastic photographs of several projects, uh, especially the latest ones. And then Paul uh, uh, Ibai Rigby took this one. And uh, uh, Paul Finkel is the, the one that we have been working with for many years. So he has many of the photographs in the book and he's a local photographer from, from Austin. Uh, just he did photographs of, for example, this is a house that we did in Wimberley, the old photograph by, by Paul. So the process of the book itself was very uncharted territory for us. We had really no sense of how much harder you know to do is to do a book it is than to do a building in terms of like the 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 the, the process is not something that we were familiar enough with we had a very clear idea one of the ideas that we had is that we wanted to do the book design the book 
the way we wanted before having a publisher. That's a very kind of unusual thing. Everybody was telling us, well, that's very strange. That's very risky. We said, well, we want to have, we have had publisher that had approached us about doing a book over the years. And we always felt like, no, no, we, we, we need to have time to, to kind of do it the way we want it. So we wanted to have that sense of uh, control, but we were having a hard time trying to find the, 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 the way to make progress until uh, Lowell Williams came, came in the picture. Lowell Williams is a, a partner of Pentagram that had retired. He's a good friend. He just, just came out of retirement to, to help us do this book. And, and it was instrumental in making it happen. And Bud Frank, Bud is a, a graduate from the school. He was a student of mine, extremely talented in the range of skills that he brings to the table. Amazing how he, he basically worked with Lowell until the end and, and he can write. He has a very a good sensibility, design sensibility from the architecture, from the photography point of view. So it was uh, almost like, uh, uh, skill set that's very hard to find in a single person. We 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 found it in 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 Bud and and Bud has been working you know in our office for for many years now, and they form a team that it was fantastic in making it happen. So there was a lot of storyboard collecting the photographs. So Lowell was basically telling us the steps that we needed to follow because it was very hard for us to to sense how we can we can make that progress. So. A lot of thumbnails, a lot of moving, you know, the concepts and 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 then collecting the material. So the the drawings. So we had the photographers, and then we had to collect the the, the drawings. And the drawings was a, a very uh, a very um, an effort that that had two parts. One is identifying drawings that we already had. So we had a lot of sketches that had been part of uh, uh, you know the development of the project. So it's sketches that we already had. So we, we, we had to identify those. And so we had sketches of different projects, still work by hand. So most of my early drawing is always by hand. So all these sketches were, were done, you know, in different, in different pieces of paper and different moments. This one is in the plane coming back from Dallas when Miguel and I were coming back from visiting the, the, the client. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an important part of the story of the project, how, how it's kind of conceived in those early sketches. So we collected those and there are different ones for this, for the tower of the Formula One. Some of them are more progress uh, uh, sketches, although we decided not to go too much that route. At some point we were going into different rabbit holes about how we can talk about the process. And we realized there's another book that could be about the process of how we go from that sketch all the way across so the drawing part is very important but we 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 had to we had to find ways to uh, reduce the 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 number of themes that we were thinking that we can explore in the book but there's some that explain that and then there are books there are drawings that were done specifically to document the projects and those were very important for us because we wanted them to be big enough in the in the book that they can be readable. I mean, we all as architects have seen so many books where the plans are so small, hard to read, hard to understand anything that you're seeing. So we wanted this to be at a scale that you can really look and understand the details. So this is a house in, in Austin that Miguel found a lot, you know, for the for the owners. And you know, we we well, Miguel told that since they won, the only the only way that we can do this project is if we preserve the house in the front, and then this is in the back. And so the the whole story of the house is very much about the drawing being very clear about how all this uh, program was added in the back of the house and preserving the front. So there are different stories that every project needed that are different. So we included some elevations, very detailed drawings of the elevations, but not of all projects. So we decided that we didn't need to show everything exactly the same for every project. So we did very large floor plans. This is this is one project that we did with Peter Walker in the landscape. And it was very important for us to show the character of the space in relation to the landscape all combined. So the drawings are very large in terms of the, this is a double spread of this drawing. And that's one aspect of the drawings, the, the sketches, the elevations, the plans. And then we did from scratch a lot of drawings that were a lot of time consuming that was worthwhile. So we wanted the book to have a, what Lowell called teachable moments where, where we can explain the project. So these are drawings that normally we, we will not do as part of the construction documents, but are part of the explaining of the concept of the project. So 
They're more about the technical side of how the projects uh, uh, were put together. It's another thing that we are very interested in, the construction side, not only the histor history of the context of the urban, but also the actual reality of the project. And, and those drawings were very specific addressing the, the most important moments or the most important contributions uh, of, of that uh, project uh, from, the, from the technical point of view. For example, in this Hindu temple, the light comes from that skylight. You never see that when you're visiting that temple because it's intended to be very, very much a, a, a part of the spirit of the, of, the, of the temple. But in this drawing, we explain how to do it, how we did it, you know, in this case with wood structure mainly and very inexpensively, but in a very efficient way, we were able to create the effect that we were looking for. So those drawings, we feel like are telling the kind of this, almost like the secrets of how we were able to do certain things. Like, for example, in this case, we brought this uh, shutter system, you know, the, this uh, 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 from Barcelona, the, 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 the way that the house can be open and closed and how it was all put together is, uh, is developing this kind of uh, axonometric construction details that are not all, always at the same scale. They're not showing exactly the same, the same thing for every project, but they, they're showing the most important thing. For example, in this, this house, the vertical house, this is, this is the critical sketch that that also I drew this sketch originally in the plane coming back from from Dallas that the, the, that I was showing the other sketch and and it's the concept of the house that is a very clear construction concept so that makes possible that corner no columns the sense of floating all that is based on something that we want to explain how it was done so that detail explains something and is laid out in a way that you can see it with together with the photograph so that was a very important aspect for us. And the other thing that it was very important is to, to show the range of the of the interest that we had. So, for example, in this case, it's a, it's a post-tension wood uh, a waffle slab that it was very involved in terms of, you know, the innovation of running cables through the beams to post-tension them. And, and then so you see the photograph, but sometimes you just don't have that technical drawing that explains it. So, as I said, it was very involved to do it. And this project is 20 years old, but we wanted to include that even if we were drawing it for the first time this way to explain it through the, the stainless steel perimeter beam, the cables running through it, the column, the way it's connected, the way it's whole, held together to the columns. So all these moments we thought that were very important contribution to, to the of the book where we, we, we have the photo that explains that, you know, this, the tower and there's a glass, there's a glass floor. Well, let's, let's look in more detail how it was built. And, and these are drawings that I love to see. And so I, I, I love, I love construction documents that show that kind of a, a, a design intent in a way that is very rich from the design point of view, but it's also very rich from the information that provides point of view. So, it is, uh, it is uh, one of the things that took a lot of effort to do because they are specifically done for this book and we had, we had to do a lot of, a lot of those. So the, the, the other ones that are a little bit in, the, in that range but a little more about the concept is uh, drawings that are explaining at a larger scale projects like the, the, the grandstand of the Formula One is, is, is how this is based on a modular system and how the modular system allow for the project to happen, you know, because it was no other way that it could have happened in the time frame that we had, but it was, you know, it, it turned out to be a brilliant approach because it was very flexible to allow for the owners to decide how much or how little they could build based on a modular system. So the budget was not, okay, cut three modules, add two more modules here. So all that is explained here in a way that it can, be understood, it can be understood at the level of the specific construction technique, but also in terms of how it generates the whole project with the variation. So there are more details and sections in that case, but it's showing those moments of how do you do the grandstand in that way? And then how do you explain how that grandstand was built? So same thing, for example, for this project we did in Mexico, an urban regeneration project, all industrial area with warehouses, very depressing corner of the city that we, transformed with this uh, 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 large mixed use development. And we fought to get a lot of uh, uh, retail to the point that we had two levels of retail in this in this corner. And then we fought to create a public space in that corner. So we, we did a drawing that you know focuses on that and how it was done in terms of like how to create that space 
and the and the the structural moves and the way that this is separated from the building to to adapt to the the geometry of the corner so these drawings are varied in the in the way that they are really looking specifically to issues that were relevant to that project and then so with all this collection you know of uh, contributors photographers drawings and material the challenge was how to put together and that's where low will play a critical role with the object itself how do we show this how do we combine these together and one of the things that you know is is surprising a little bit about the book is that the way and this is we, we were following lowell's lead in a lot of this because he has a, a very good eye for this so for example the book starts with uh, uh the uh collection is uh, is the book is book ended by 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 uh uh, the photographs of Sebastian, but with no captions of any kind. So there's no page number, different different texture paper, just like the images. Very quiet, very very beautifully paired in terms of like how all of a sudden we are discovering that Sebastian is telling us things about our work just in the way he photographed them and the way you can put things side by side. So you. You, you, you start looking at the we, 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 we ended up with 48 pinhole photographs, we are including 24 in the book. And in the book, there are 12 at the beginning, 12 at the end. And there's this kind of sense of a little bit of intriguing thing, because a lot of these projects are not shown anywhere else, you know, so this is sometimes the only photograph of some of the projects, because they, they, they are not shown in more detail, we had to do a selection. But the pairing, it was very interesting for us, it's like how to see the, 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 the projects uh, through his eyes in the, in the way he put this together. Uh, this is a quote from Charles Guadme. He died in 2009, so he didn't see a lot of the work that was done here, but uh, we, we wanted to pay homage to, to him in a way by having him in the, in, the, in the book. And this is where the book kind of starts the normal way. So the, the, in terms of the, the, the kind of boilerplate information about the, the Library of Congress and all the data and all that, and the table of contents. So the table of contents, for example, you know that that photo essay is not even part of the page numbers. It's just at the beginning, almost like a separate little book in itself. And then and then this is the table of contents that organized the book in the introduction. That the, really the the foreword by Michael Sorkin, then the main article by Juan Luis, an article that I wrote, and then the twenty projects. So the four chapters and then the the photo essay at the end. So. The, the first one, as I said, is uh, Michael Sorkin and his title, not surprising, he was going to, you know, give us something with a, a punch. He, he titled the, art, the article Monks and Cowboys. And, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's as everything that he, he, he did beautifully written, but he's capturing very well the essence of Austin and the, the city and the urban side of things. And, but, but he started with, uh, you know, interesting, you know, he has this way of, of writing. He started the essay in a very kind of direct way. The work, the work of Mirror River Architects is thoughtful. It has depth. It's not angry. It's not arbitrary. It plays no games. It, it's rarely gestural. And when it is, the gesture is both concise and memorable. So there, there are things that, you know, it's interesting to hear someone coming from another kind of angle completely to talk about these things and, and to describe the work, but we, we, we think that, and this is one of the things that I told Michael, and, and I say, hey, Michael, I want you to, to write because I like the fact that you're an architect that is interested in the city, that is interested in urban issues. You're an educator, and obviously you write beautifully, but, but I like the fact that he has those things, that he has a little bit of that sense of what I feel like we, we need to be as architects. We need, to, we need to think about the city. We need to think about you know, how to communicate. So he was particularly good at that. And, and, and I think that the writing is obviously beautiful because he just wrote like, you know, like he could be a writer more than an architect if he, if he had wanted to choose that career. But uh, the, the, second the, second, uh, the second essay is the one that Juan Luis uh, wrote, is more in-depth, uh, is, uh, is, is, the, is the one that gave the title to the book. He titled his essay, Building a New Arcadia. And we ended up choosing that as the title of the book. And, and, and from the beginning, you can tell just the, the first uh, part of the book, uh, the, of the essay is called Living, Working, Dreaming in Austin the city as a state of mind. So he captures very well the sense of place that Austin represents and how our work over 20 years 
are part of that story. So in, 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 in a way, it's a, it's a very, very uh, good analysis, more in depth. He divided it in interesting chapters about uh, different with different ways of reading things. And, and, and you know, he spent time here. He came, uh, he, he took his time and he, he, he wrote a very uh, thorough uh, analysis of, of the work in the context of, of the city. And again, connecting with that notion of the city. Again, he's an architect and also an urban designer. Then, then I wrote an essay myself, and this is this is the one we're introducing Austin in, in another way. So this is my personal take of, of how, it ha and this is something that sometimes you just don't realize until you spend time and you look back and you start reflecting on this. So this is something that when I write to Austin, I didn't know anything about Austin. I didn't know about the history of Austin. I didn't know about, you know, how Austin came to be the way it is. And this is something that I think is is, is fascinating for everybody to, to learn. And I keep learning more and more things. I, I, I mentioned in the, in the lottery uh, on Wednesday about uh, how I think about these issues when I swim at Barton Springs pool. And, and yesterday I saw this documentary that I mentioned about that just came out called uh, uh, Austin Green Identity. And it, 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 it traces the story of Austin and anyone that can go, you can see his PBS uh, documentary. But it just explains that cities are the way they are because some people are fighting for certain things. And in this case, the, the way we always associate Austin with this beautiful natural landscape is the result of a lot of people, uh, you know, fighting for it. And, and the story of how that happened and the, the environmental uh, design emphasis that is part of uh, building in Austin. I know it as an architect, it's a pain in the neck to deal with all those regulations, but it is beautiful, the result of a lot of the things that we impose on ourselves, you know, and, and this is something that I wanted to explain in this, uh, in this essay. And that's where we, we, we brought Ivan Ban to take these beautiful photographs of the, of the city and just trying to understand these water systems, this tree canopy, all that is the result of a very specific sense of identity that Austin has developed over time. And it's very critical to why we think Austin is an attractive place to be and how more and more people keep thinking it's an attractive place to be. And this is another thing that I write about. I write about that in 25 years working here, I've seen people of all types and I, we have done projects for not only obviously the government side, the university, the, the, the developers and nonprofits and faith groups or, and then individuals that are from any walk of life, any religion. I mean, I, I'm, when I think about it, it's just pretty amazing to me to think that we have had clients that are Mormon, Protestant, Catholic, Hindi, Hindu, Muslim uh, in Austin. And they are all looking for the same thing. And they're all, sometimes there are same-sex couples. Sometimes they're, they're, they're the families with children that are very conservative. Sometimes there are people that are super, you know, liberal. Some people are, you know, from any place in the world also. We have had clients from every continent, from every kind of racial group, interracial fa families. And what is beautiful is to me to see this as how everybody's looking for that Arcadia. That is basically what brought them here and what the city is trying to do is welcoming them. Obviously it has a history of not welcoming certain groups. And, and this is the, 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 the thing that Austin needs to deal with, but it is a very important experience, personal experience that is basically explained through this essay. And the essay is, is, is accompanied with, a, it's almost like a portrait. These are windows of 10 acres that we are looking into the city saying how people live in this city. This is our experience seeing how this has happened. So we, we're showing 10 case studies of 10 projects that we have done where we're showing a 10 acre window into the neighborhood where that project is, a closer look into the area around that particular project and giving some data about the neighborhood. When the neighborhood was created, what is the density of the neighborhood and what is the, the name of the neighborhood and the, the characteristics. So it's giving a sense of, 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 of how the book, uh, so how, the, how people live here. And we have a one single photograph of that particular project. And, and this we did of 10 different 10 different uh, uh, projects, 10 different neighborhoods from the 1880s, from the 1920s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 80s, and 90s. So this is kind of going almost like a cutting across all the different periods of Austin evolution and, and showing that there are a lot of very interesting 
similarities and differences. There are hills, they're close to the water, there are courtyard houses, there are houses that are very much responding to particular conditions. You have a view like this, instead of showing this by itself, we said, no, we wanna show that this is full of houses all around. Sometimes, sometimes in magazines, it's the opposite. You wanna show that it feels like it's in the middle of nowhere. No, this house is sandwiched in between these two houses, but when you get above the canopy of trees, you can get this. And this is the condition of this urban forest all around, all around Austin. So it's something that it goes from the range of houses that are close to the water, places that are hard to believe they're in the middle of, of, of a municipal city. It's not in the outside the city. And that's one chapter of the book. And then the, the bulk of the book is the, is the 20 projects that we highlighted with more detail. And these projects are organized in no particular order. This is another thing that is interesting and is very unusual, but we basically decide no typologically, no chronological order, no uh, uh, programmatic or, or, or geographical. They're, they're, just, they're, just, they're just shown the way they happen in our office where they can be at the same time a very, very you know, non-profit oriented, a pro bono project, a high-end residential or a government building. So all these are happening at the same time. So we wanna show it this way. And the projects are shown with uh, an introduction double spread that has a text that Lowell wanted to condense in that text 300 words, you know, the essence, the idea of the project. So there's a title, subtitle, titles and subtitles were all created by Bud. The text, I wrote the text with, uh, you know, the editing that came after, but I wrote all these texts with the sense of having a kind of consistent voice about the 20 projects that gave the essence of the of the project and then there's a more detailed text that goes inside with all the story of the project in terms of the plans site plan access this is a vertical house in dallas the sketch that show that concept more detailed description and then the the idea of how the building was put together like we were showing here that the, the story of the project with the information the section the plans with the photography kind of complementing the plan so you can get through the project. And sometimes even showing things that you don't see. I say, hey, where's the architecture? Say, well, we're looking out. This house was very much about looking into this amazing garden that the owner did for himself. And this is this is how we, we wanted to tell the story. Some other projects have different stories, but this, this first page is the same. So this is the Performing Arts Center that we did with Fluger Architects here in Austin. So it's, it's a very different set of issues very different about getting together about a public bindle in an area that is learning in East Austin to be more urban. So it's an urban emphasis and we wanted to have a drawing that will reflect on that. So this drawing is very carefully explaining all the public spaces that were generated around a building that has an urban DNA that is not the essence of Austin. Austin has to learn to do this more compact city approach to to the to the growth of the city so this building is responding to that and and that's what we wanted to tell in the story of the building same thing this is the one in mexico so the, you can see that the the problem I'm, I'm not going to get into more detail but this is the essence of how you have the first page with the text subtitle we you know we had several projects in mexico and this is this is one of them but it's trying to show the the idea of how this corner became a public space and, and how is that given back to the city, even if it's a private developer. So the drawings help reinforce that aspect of the project. So these are the pages, like we're flipping through the pages. And so we have like this uh, several projects and, and some of the projects require few pages to tell the story. Some projects require many more pages. So we didn't want to be rigid about that either. So there's projects that are small, so they're very, you know, this is the restroom. It's a very small project. Again, it has that teachable moment. It has the photographs. Some projects require more to explain themselves, but we wanted that same kind of theme of the, the, the combination of drawings, the large plans, like we were saying. And then the, 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 the way it feels, you know, this a section and a plan of the bridge, for example, or showing the bridge uh, in the context. So all this, all this is done in a way that we can accommodate to the story that we're telling in each project so for example the center the, the circle of the americas is a very different project very large with many components so we wanted to convey the sense of gathering the excitement the movement the energy that came the public spaces that we created the grand plaza the the, the occupation of those spaces that these are the technical sides of the grandstand and we wanted to show also that the book has those places of retreat where people find their own little 
refuge in the in the sheltering from the, the 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 world and then there are places where people need to get together when you look at this it's very hard to think about when we were able to get together like this now that we're in the middle of the pandemic but this is this is what people need people need places to get together places to go back to that are their private spaces so the book conveys this kind of back and forth in the way the projects are organized as well so it is uh, it is uh, this is a longer you know, a story that we need to take. And, and we, we had every project like this. We're going to show all of them. I'm going to, I'm almost done, but I just wanted to show the, the, that either if it's a historic house that we converted, you know, restore, you know, in this house, it's Miguel's house. He found letters on the walls that were hidden from the original occupant of the house at the turn of the 19th century. And he used a lot of the things that she referred in the letters uh, to restore the house, you know, even the colors, what she described, nonprofit for, you know, in East Austin or, or a temple, a Hindu temple. The, 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 the projects always start with this kind of same, same introduction, and then they have a little different story. So we have 20 of these. And then after that, we have uh, a conversation with uh, 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 Carlos Jimenez. And this is, this is what Carlos Jimenez is. Everyone that knows Carlos, he's just a wonderful uh, person to have conversations with because he's so, so uh, uh, calm, so gentle, so uh, cultured, and so uh, he, spoke, he speaks beautifully. And we thought that he would be, rather than asking him to write anything, we said, why, why don't we do a conversation with you? And he just came very well prepared. We came, he came to, to Austin. We did it in Miguel's house. And, and this is the, the conversation that we had. So it was a fantastic dialogue with him. And he documented the, 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 basically the way he wanted to. So the, he asked the questions that he wanted and he took the conversation in the directions that he wanted. So he was very generous on his part and we we're very thankful for his uh, uh, contributions. And then Nina wrote what we call, what he, she called future forward. So it's a little more, like she's just speculating on what's coming next. and. You know, we're seeing this as the first of 20 years. We're going to do another one of 20 years. Maybe we do one in 10 years. But uh, so she she wrote a, a beautiful piece about, you know, all the things that she saw that they were not in the book from the point of view of projects that were not built. We decided to include only projects that were built in the project, in the book. But Nina makes reference to some of the things that are not built that she knows about that, that are more about things that she imagines can happen in the future. And then the book ends with this uh, same idea of, of uh, another 12 photographs by Sebastian of that photo essay that is just giving us a sense of the work through his eyes. I mean, there's a lot of photographs that is about looking out. Another one, as you can see, looking into specific things. That's the Hindu temple. That's the, the, the performing space. And then the connection with the landscape and the, the way that, so the, the, the way this, these photographs were, you know, they're quiet, they're, you know, obviously there's normally no people because it's, this takes forever to do these exposures. And then the, the last part is, uh, is, the, is the, the back of cover that uh, Lowell thought that it, was, it would be good to do a little bit of this kind of mix of variety of, of, of work that is uh, shown in this gridded format. And, and, and it's, it's a balance for the, for the, for the cover. And I'm, you know, obviously the UT Press has been a fantastic uh, editor. So I forgot to say that we went to UT Press. UT Press is here in Austin. I teach at U University of Texas. I am a big believer of public universities and public dimension of things in general. So we thought that that would be the first uh, uh, place that we want to. They were super excited about what we presented to them. And, and, and we ended up basically not, no needing to look for any publisher because UT Press jumped on it. Uh, as uh, uh, as soon as we presented the project to them, so we we have been very th uh, thankful because they have been very meticulous and very particular about you know making the final production of the book happen, and they have a thirty percent off if you go to their website. So they wanted me to include a, a reference to that aspect of the of the book, so it can be bought in many places, but they have a specific discount. So I just wanted to to mention in case you're interested. Uh, just warning is it weights more than six pounds. So <laughs> it's just like pretty impressive in that regard. But uh, uh, this is it. So I know that it took a little longer, Leora, than I was supposed to, but, but uh, you said 45, but it's about 45, right? With the introduction. Perfect. Thank you. And so, I, I'm going to rush to buy it and try not to drop it on my foot. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions, comments. Uh, please feel free. Feel free to turn on your camera if it is not on. I, I had prepared a few questions to start the conversation, but uh, I think Juan gave us so much to talk about and to discuss. But uh, I, I do have a question observation that I wanted to ask Juan to, uh, to comment on. Uh, yeah. One of the books that I love uh, already, I think uh, almost a 25 year old book is The Culture of Building by Howard Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, Howard taught here, I learned in the 1980s uh, mm -hmm. before most of us came here. Uh, but he, his hypothesis is that the architect have to spend decades in a place in order to really understand the culture of building of that place. And when I was reading your book, Juan, I was thinking that you and Miguel are perfect for Austin, uh, for this frontier zone that, uh, that we have in which the Latin way of masonry building kind of blends with the Anglo way of the, the frame. Uh, both of you were trained on, on the more masonry techniques of uh, Madrid and uh, Spain and Puerto Rico, but both of you have been to New York and probably worked many years on the frame mode. And coming to Austin, you are able to, your drawings show that really, really well. Uh, that there is a combination of uh, masonry, uh, heavy walls, and light frame walls in your buildings. And I wanted to start the conversation by asking you to comment on that. Well, yes, you, 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 bring, you bring with you whatever, you know, has been part of your uh, education. And, and both Miguel and I have a uh, uh, education in, in, in our schools that are there is uh, very technical oriented, very you know obviously humanist as well. But you know I think that how we build and 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 the way we build is something that is very important to us. And I think that the you're you're right that sometimes we 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 build on that combination of the the the, the heaviness of you know the, the Hindu temple is an example. Those blocks that you know we 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 started to use this you know the, we created this courtyard with these blocks of limestone and then it's contrasting with this very light stipple. And at the end of the and at the end of the day, in many projects, that dialogue can relate to very particular aspects of that project. So. We both uh, brought a very uh, strong awareness of the construction part of architecture that is very tactile and very, very grounded in, in, in the place. But at the same time, kind of not feeling too limited by that. So that's the, the, the other thing that you, you know, you, you go to a place and you say, okay, here's how we do things here. So it is a little bit sometimes very, uh, it could be a little rigid in the way it's presented. So we, we wanted to take that as a starting point. And sometimes you do these things unconsciously, but it, it, comes, it happens that way, but there's a strong sense of connection with the place. You're right about that. Do we have any students here with questions or comments for Juan? You said Sebastian's photos helped you see your work in a new way. And uh, the essay you wrote helped you understand Austin in a way you hadn't yet considered. I'm wondering what you think the single most important thing you learned about yourself and your practice was in creating this book. <laughs> so I, I heard Max. That's Max. I didn't see. I, I didn't. I didn't see you. Right, Max. This is you, Max. Right. Yes, it's me. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I recognize your voice. I don't see you, but I recognize your voice. So, I'm well, in Charlton's that, office. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you for, oh, there you go. There you go. I see you now. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think you, you constantly learn about, about, uh, about things, you know, and think, I think that is, uh, is beautiful sometimes when you, when you can stop and reflect and look back. Sometimes when you're so busy doing, 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 you have less time to kind of look back and reflect. So when I, when I was talking about Sebastian looking at the work, it is, it, is, uh, it is interesting because you, you say, well, maybe, maybe he's telling us something by, by the fact that he's framing views this way. And all of a sudden you say, oh, yeah, he's right. We were looking for that. So that sense of build up to a particular kind of prospect of viewing for some place. And all of a sudden he seems to be gravitating towards those moments that all of a sudden you, you remember that were the drivers of, of the project. So 
but you don't you don't know or you are not necessarily as aware as to, until you know you hear someone saying it or you you see those photographs so i think that in a way the the the, the thing that was more interesting that we learned is 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 this sense that we, we we are part of something so we are we are part of something that is is happening around you and and i think that the the notion of trying to isolate yourself is 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 empty but i think that we wanted the the, the the book to be very much embedded in in the in the in the place and in the in the people that have interacted with us and and so we we wanted that be part of the book so we we're learning how important those things are. So we, 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 we take very seriously the, the personal relation the, the, with the people that we work with and, and we want that to be very much coming out in, in the work. So seeing yourself as part of something larger is, is something that we feel like, for example, if you ask me, I would, I would say that's one of the things that is more important. All the time we say, hey, we're doing this, but we're part of a tradition in Austin. We're part of a, an, an, an identity that the Austin has developed and we are just contributing to it and we are we are expanding it because we're newcomers we're immigrants we came here like you know they say you're not from texas we know but we came here as soon as we we could so and you you say yes this is this is this, there are, there are issues there are challenges but we we found a place here like all the all the people and we are part of it so we wanted the book to to not convey that sense of um uniqueness that sometimes in in architecture and 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 getting things out of context that is so easy now with the quickly Instagram, you see a photo, I like it. I don't know anything about it, but I like it. So yes, there's some of that, you know, in, and, and Michael Sorkin writes about it, a you know, a little bit when he talks a little bit about that aspect of the, there's a gesture there, but why is it there and what is it doing and who is serving it and who is serving. And so we wanted that story to be told as well, not just to focus on that kind of, catchy moment of an image so good to see you max good thank to you. see you too thank you we have a question from dean addington next hi um and actually this relates very much to max's question um you know we think about the lay public often imagines architects uh as singular heroic authors uh in, in charge of a project and uh, you know, it's, it's really clear from your work how much you talk about this community uh, of people that you work with uh, and, uh, and, and are uh, impacted by. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about either conversations we've had over the years, but, but also sort of the, the, the different lectures that I've seen of yours where you are inflected by sources that sometimes are quite a far afield. Uh, that where different ideas come from, where different conversations occur. And the work is a reflection of all of these sort of multiple nodes and multiple points of communication, exploration, other references, other conversations that come into place. Even though it's a singular work, all of those inflections you know, uh, appear within the work in, in, in one form or another. And I, and, and you talked, of course, about people like Michael Sorkin and Charles Gwathme, but you also have a, a much larger circle than that. I remember where you talked about uh, scholars like Mary Miller and, and many others that, that the, there are pieces of, of what they bring to play that have changed the way that, that you think. So I have a two part question. Mm. And, and the first part is, uh, you know, it's clear you were really influenced you know, by some, some key individuals. Can you think about a, a moment in time when a, like that proverbial light bulb went off and you, you, because of a conversation or something unexpected you were introduced to, you changed the way that you were thinking about something or it opened up an entirely new field of interest for you. And then the second part of it is in your own teaching, um, is the way that you de design a studio and develop a studio and a studio brief part of that process that you're also using it to sort of introduce yourself to, to new approaches and new ideas? So it's kind of a two-part question. Yeah, no, it's, uh, no, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, very, it's very true what you're saying. I mean, there's a limitation of what you can talk about in terms of uh, uh, influences and you're totally right. I mean, I, I I have a passion for uh, pre-Columbian architecture and, and 
you know, I keep doing research on the city of Teotihuacan. I've written about it. And I have, I had colleagues in New York City that told me, why in the world are you interested in those things? That they, they, were, they were going crazy. It's like, why, why? I mean, you're an architect working here in New York. What, why are you into it? I'm traveling to Mexico. To, and Michael Coe, Mary Miller, George Kugler, Vincent Scully, I, those are very influential. And they're very influential because to me, they're connecting with the past in a very universal way. And so when, when I tell people about those things, what, what I'm interested in when I look at Teotihuacan is why are they doing what they're doing? And what we do as architects is not that different because we are designing for people that have a specific goals in mind. And so the goal of a developer may be different than the goal of, of, uh, of a Hindu uh, Swami that is asking us to do a temple. But I need to understand that Hindu uh, Swami. And I do not understand that, that, that developer. And they are coming from different angles, but as our ability as architects is, is to try to get into someone else's mind and some and understanding and seeing not as a, as a loss, but seeing as an opportunity. And, and I think that these things from the past are, are to me ways to see that it's not that different. The common thread is not that different. Everybody's looking. I mean, that some people are maybe doing things better than others, no question about it. But there are moments about how, you know, these interests in these uh, uh, scholars could be related to that sense of learning about the human condition and how people are trying to do the things that they're trying to do. So I think that in a way, going backwards and saying, trying to understand what they did, maybe is giving more opportunities to be more able to understand what people now want when they come to you. So, so, and this is something that is very important for the students to understand also. So there's the, there's the will of the designer, but you need to align it with the specifics of, of that moment. And you cannot force things that are not belonging into that particular moment. So this is something that I'm very, very particular in studios. I try to be very careful about not imposing what I would do in design studio. So I mean, I mean I'm very proud to the, 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 I don't get comments from students about trying to do their project, never will. And I, this is a very difficult adjustment for all of you that are practicing, practicing architects, you know that it's an adjustment that you have to learn to make in your office, you need to call the shots and you need to be constantly making decision about what we need to do. And, but when you are in the studio, you need to adopt a very different role. You're part of that context that is helping the students make decisions, but you cannot be the one deciding for them. And this is, this is something, so that's different than the question that you asked, but yes, the question that you asked very much so the studios, especially, I mean, especially the studios that I do when I go to Mexico, when I go to Spain and think about the cities and think about the places. And, and I kind of reflect on those things with the students. So it is obviously all the work that I've been doing at UT is very influential in the work that is part of this book. It's not, we try to do that article, for example, the landscape city, not to make it too academic, but it's, it's, it's distilling a lot of the ideas that have evolved from traveling, thinking about this with the students and, and thinking about those things. And your first question that is interesting too, you were saying, what a particular moment you remember. And, and I don't, I mean, there are probably many moments that I would need a little more time to think, but there's one that probably comes to mind that it happened early. I mean, because I haven't even talked about the people in Spain that were very influential. And, and obviously my father was a great architect. So that's the first influence. And, and, and he had a lot of the same curiosity that I, I think I inherited for things from the past, but he was a very much a practicing architect until he started teaching late in life. Very late in life, he, he, he started to teach in the school in Madrid. When I was getting out of the school, I finished school and that's when he started teaching in the school. But I remember that when, when he was still not teaching in the school and I was in the architecture school, I, I, uh, I had to choose what studio to take. And I remember that there was a professor there called Juan, Dalue, Juan Daniel Fuyaondo. I mean, it's a little bit like Sorkin, you know, in the sense that he was brilliant writer, an architect that practiced, the editor of a magazine, super influential in the 60s, very, very intellectual, but at the same time, very uh, interested in good design from the point of view of the practical side. And I remember that, he, my, I, and, I, and I told, I told uh, my father, I don't know what studio to take next year. And he told me, he told me about Fui, Fui Aondo, and he told me, he showed me some of the magazines that he had done, the writings that he had done, and it felt like so different than my father. So, because it was like this super richly intellectual way of seeing architecture. And, and I say, that's where I want to go. 
So I put myself in this in the place where I felt like it was giving me a very, very different approach to what I was seeing with my father. I was involved in doing projects every day, a practicing architect, and that he was trying to solve projects. And I was exposed to that. This other one was giving me something that then I found almost the same pairing with Sorkin and Guafni when I was at Yale. So in a way they were giving me, Guafni was like my father in the sense that they were very good designers, practicing architects. And Sorkin was like Cuyondo, was extended that conversation about architecture beyond just doing projects and, and what, what it can be, you know, and how it can be uh, open to other influences and other disciplines and how you can, you can think about big, big picture ideas, but without losing track of the, of the reality of architecture. So in a way, I think that that was a critical moment because I kept looking for that. So when I went to Yale, I said, I want to be with Michael Sorkin because he's going to give me something different. And I, and I, and I want to learn about that. And I think it's, it's something that I always tell the students, don't, don't, we, we live in a world where it's very easy to find things that are exactly what you know, what you like, what you think that you, you know, and I say, look, look, look for things that may be different and, and don't, go too quickly in deciding I like or I don't like something. Just give time to, to postpone that decision as much as you can. Just learn as much as you can before you decide if you like or not something. So that was one moment that I thought. All right, I think we're a little bit over time and I know folks have to get to studio. Um, so I think we'll end there, but thank you so much. This was fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to ordering the book myself. Okay, thank you. Take care, all. Thank you, everybody. Two weeks. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, all.